Greetings, I am the blacksmith and welcome to the forge. So swords are awesome, and that's not just my opinion, that is scientific fact. Swords are simply awesome. And if you don't agree, well, first of all, be surprised you're watching, although, welcome, I hope you're having a good time. But also you're wrong. However, not all swords are made equal, and today's subject will make that painfully clear. Let's have a look at arguably the dumbest sword in history, the Cinque Dea. So obviously calling this mess the dumbest sword, it's a bit hyperbolic. You know, there was just no way that the Italians could have known that these things would come around. Either way, the Cinque Dea is likely one of the most short-lived weapon designs in history. And to be fair, that might be a bit hyperbolic too, but maybe it's not that far off. The first one was made around about 1460 and seemed to have been a complete novelty. And there hasn't really been any that we found past 1520. So if you quit smoking and you have a healthier diet, you might actually have a good chance at living longer than the Chiquidea's popularity. So back when I started journalism, yeah, I, I know, I know. But tell me all of your life decisions were well thought out at that age. Either way. I had a class of, that was called art history, which is where I learned about all the hyper expensive art made in the Renaissance. And considering the Cinque Deo was found exclusively in Italy during the Renaissance makes a lot of sense. And I have a bit of a theory about this. So between the medieval period and the Renaissance, the nature of what is considered art changed drastically. So where before every painting would be a monarch, a saint or a battlefield, in short, you know, something that would never offend either church or king, the Renaissance became a lot more liberal in this regard. You know, new art styles and new subjects came along, and some of the greatest pieces of art we trace back to this time period. Just one of these evolutions was a growing interest in old Greek and Roman cultures, especially mythology. And the reason for this is that by the religious standard of the time, those ancient cultures were exciting. And yes, the, the whole interest is the excuse to display nudity and splashing colors under the pretense of cultural sophistication. Alright, nice tension I hear you say. Get to the, get back on track, boomer. But here's where it's getting but here's where it gets interesting. Compare these weapons to the Chinquidea. They predated the Chinquidea by several centuries, yet the construction of the hilt is strikingly similar. I now consider that these weapons are from ancient Greece, and we can start to connect some dots. And finally, the center point of the Chinquideas, you know, these little like nice motifs in gold that they have on the blade. They almost always depict Greek and Roman figures and myths. So just keep this in the back of your mind for later, because we will come back to it. Now for now, let me just give you an idea of how big the Cinque Dea actually is. Because, well, let me give you a standard medieval longsword for reference. So as you can see, the Cinque Dea is pretty short. And so short it lives pretty much in the same space as the sax did, which we have mentioned a couple times in previous videos. It's the space where it's, it's not quite a sword, it's not quite a dagger. The, most of the times the blade would measure anywhere between 15 and 50 centimeters in length, and it has 6 and 20 inches for you Americans. And so now we have to make the comparison, is the Cinque Dea either a viable dagger or a viable sword? Because, you know, it's, it's not really either. And the answer is, to be frank, a resounding no. But let's actually make a comparison and start with daggers, shall we? So, consider that this dagger from the same time period. It's on display in the Met Museum, it has an acute tip, and it widens very marginally towards the base of the blade. The Cinque Dea throws pretty much all of this to the wind, and is a whopping 7.5 centimeters wide at the base. Like it might as well be a shield at that point. Also, its tip is rounded instead, so... Why is the dagger better than the Cinque Dea? So daggers are made for stabbing. The wider they are at the base, the more inconvenient it becomes to stab with it. 
the extreme taper on the Cinque Dea means that way more force is needed for the same amount of penetration, as you will need to displace more material as you progressively push the blade into your enemy. Also, the dagger is usually a quite a useful sidearm when knights get entangled and main weapons are too awkward to use in extreme close quarters. Now, this usually opens up an opportunity to try and slip a dagger through the weak spots in your opponent's armors, you know, like the elbows or like the armpits. However, you can't really do that with the Cinquodea because because of the extreme taper, it is so thick at the base, it becomes incredibly awkward to try and like fit it into any nooks or crannies like that. So it's probably just not that great as a sidearm for knights either. So considering the rounded tip on top of this, we can say the Cinque Deo probably just wasn't a stabbing weapon. And that's not to say that there is no benefit to having a long dagger that's good at cutting, but frankly it won't do you much good on a battlefield where you can expect to face armored opponents. So then we gotta ask, is it a good sword? And no, no it's not. In my opinion, we have two types of sword. You have versatile and specialized swords. A versatile sword is a multi-purpose weapon that can both cut and trust with relatively equal proficiency. A specialized sword would be one that is made to either cut or trust to its highest potential. In other words, swords that are good at just one of the two functions and the wielder is comfortable enough because it's so good at just one of those that the wheeler is comfortable closing the door on another. Uh, you know, an example would be a long sword and an arming sword. Uh, they're pretty versatile weapons. They can they can cut, they can trust just fine. Or you could take something like a kopesh, which would be a specialized cutting sword, or a rapier, which is a specialized sword for trusting. And uh, what is the chinquidea? Well, we already discussed it's not fit for trusting. Well, you you could. Honestly, you could, but, you know, good luck with that. So, is it a good cutting sword? Well, maybe it's not as bad as you'd expect, honestly, because we've been pretty down on the Cinque Deo, so let's give it its due. So, because of the blade that's so large, it will probably have a fair amount of weight to it, which, incidentally, is what the series of fullers is for that you see on the blade. It's, you know, it's this fluted design. It is, it is there to reduce the weight of the weapon. So it'll likely pack a bit of a punch when you swing it at someone, just because of how heavy it is. However, we also need to ask ourselves where the center of mass is, and considering the width at the base of the blade, it will likely be pretty close to the hilt. And this means you will simply need more force to do the same amount of damage as you would with a blade where the center of mass is further up the blade, like you could expect from something like a kopesh or a saber. Um, for this reason, of course, heavy cutters usually have their center mass way up the blade. So, really, it's not a very good cutting sword either, though it's not the worst one either. Do keep in mind that I'm, I'm generalizing a bit as varying blade lengths, they would make a difference. Though not enough for it to become a good sword. Now, you might be able to then sell this as a versatile sword, since the center of mass is rather close to the hilt, you know, likely have a decent amount of point control when trusting, so you could like land pretty precise thrust. But as we already dis discussed, its design is holding it back from being a, a very efficient in this manner as well. So, if the Cinque Deo fails to be a good dagger, and it doesn't manage to be a good sword, then why does it exist, honestly? And the reality is likely that it's simply not a good battlefield weapon. However, the, an the analysis completely changes if you value it as a civilian weapon. And when the only foes you are likely to face are uh, unarmored tugs, the question changes from is it good to is it good enough? And let's just give it some credit here, it probably is. So let's take a bit of a detour and talk about Italian fashion for a second. So at the end of the 13th century, armors and armors in northern Italy, uh, they had acquired quite a reputation and they were exporting arms and armor all across Europe. At the start of the 14th century, they were the first to actually complete, uh, to, to create perfect complete plate armor that covered the entire body. Now, of course, everyone of your repute needed to own one of these, and Italian armor was distribu distributed widely, and even when, it, when local blacksmiths tried to recreate it, 
they would still create all of these like Italian like benchmarks and like little Italian traits and subtleties in there. And so like Italian fashion became became spread all across Europe. And in a sense, Italy became the place where fashion came from. And that's likely what the Cinque Deo was. It was fashion. And just like that, though not even half as stupid as many of our current fashion trends, it lost its popularity when the next big thing came about. So let's just re-examine the Cinque Deo, then. not as a battlefield weapon, but under these new parameters. So what we need from the Cinque Deo is it needs to look fashionable, it has to be a good status indicator, and it simply needs to be good enough in the in the off chance that you actually get into some combat. So as far as looks go, the Cinque Deo is clearly a way to show off. You know, clear concessions were made in terms of usability to achieve. And like this aesthetically pleasing design, you know, first such that little cross section on the hilt, I don't know what it's for, but it looks cool, right? It's completely unnecessary, but it's present in pretty much every Cinque Dea that was made in the 15th century, as far as I can tell. Now, of course, there was the blade as well, you know, we already discussed how the Cinque Dea would be way better if the blade was a lot smaller, like a lot narrower at the base. And this was clearly done just to provide a big canvas that they could put gold etched figures on and like little like blue designs and like just extravagant stuff. And another thing would be the central motif of the blade, which is always created upwards towards the towards the hilt. It's not like you would see in most timers where where there was etching on the blade. It is always oriented towards the point, but here it is towards the hilt. And it's likely just so that the, the motif is upright when you are showing off the blade to someone. And, you know, just another little thing that goes to show you that this really wasn't a fighting weapon. It was just made to, to look good. It was made to show off. And, well, how does it serve as a status symbol? Well, I mean, place yourself in 15th century Italy and they're essentially a sharp Rolex. Now, I've seen very few Cinque Deas actually lack the lavish embellishments that the weapon is known for. You know, the intricate shapes, the fancy inlays in the hilt, you know, gold leaf of plenty, blued metal, and it would make for an extremely pricey piece of art for sure. And clearly this was meant for the 1% of the time, you know, just for the express goal that they can show that they're part of that 1%. And let's say now you get into a fight, you know, no firearms are involved, and you have a Cinque Dea. And frankly, I think you'll, you'll be pretty happy to have it. Now, of course, you'd still rather have a sword, but those are just pretty cumbersome to carry around all day, and pretty awkward when you're sitting down, frankly. So, let, let's, just, let's just say, like, these criteria suffice. You want to feel fancy, you don't want to be weighed down excessively, and you just want to look good. Well, good for you, Sharon, but also the Cinque Dea is probably for you. Now, essentially, what you have is a slightly worse short sword that looks good and it doesn't really hold you back much at all. And since you're not expecting to end up in life or death situations on a daily basis, it's probably good enough. Now, if you are somehow actually expecting to get into life or death situations every day, the problem is probably you. And you should really reconsider some things. However, the Cinque Dea is not the weapon for you. I, I would actually recommend the spear and maybe some self-help books as well. Though, honestly, before doing this little analysis out loud, I didn't actually think I'd come up with many positive conclusions about the Cinque Dea. But yeah, honestly, as a fashionable accessory that can serve as a self-defense weapon on top of it, you could honestly do a lot worse than this. And, well, before we actually look at how this weapon was constructed, I wanted to address some information that I found online during my research. And the first point would be that it's somehow like the Cinque Dea could have become popular because you wouldn't be allowed to carry a sword in Italian cities, but the Cinque Dea was somehow exempt, be it through status or specified blade length, and then it would be attempted to like tie it into the only to the only the nobility were allowed to carry swords like like thing that people like to say a lot. 
So actually there does seem to be a fair amount of logic to this and you know some indirect evidence to back it up as well in theory. So like for example according to a school like Gladiatoria it would be pretty common in both medieval England and France for the carrying of swords in the city to be prohibited or at least restricted with you know, a handful of exemptions like if you're leaving or entering the city. However, it's, it's really important that we don't start seeing European culture as a monolith, because it most definitely wasn't. And where England and France, they had pretty much consolidated their dominion over their borders, Italy didn't really have this luxury at all. In fact, to explain to you how different Italy was from the rest of Europe, I actually got one of my buddies, Harlequin, to explain to you quite how different it was. Because, well, he actually started to stuff in college, whereas I just read a bunch of books and started a YouTube channel. So I'll let him take it from here. Italy in the 15th century is the center of war and evolution in science of the continent. Its many cities, states, duchies and baronies all vying for control of a land steeped in tradition and might. The largest players on this board can be broadly stated as six. To the south, the Kingdom of Naples, with support of Sicily and Spain, tried to dominate the peninsula. The Papal States controlled the center portion, but by the end of the century had lost most of their holdings and power to emerging city-states and foreign intervention. The proud city of Florence brought their own magnificence to the century, with strong patrician families ruled by the Medicis and the advent of banking houses. Their clashes with the Papal States, Naples and France would slowly peter out their flame into a darker age. The North was the playground of two homegrown powers. The wealthy trade center of Venice with its strong republican traditions and even larger coffers, and the powerhouse of Milan led by the newly settled Sforza family made their claim in the most northern and eastern sections of the landmass. The sixth player on the field was France that after the end of the Hundred Years' War sought to stake claims on the southern power of Naples, much to the chagrin of Spain. In invading and meddling France made the peninsula even riper for plucking by the foreign powers. So, but I'm, I went looking for direct sources regarding Italy and I couldn't really come up with much at all. No, however, I did find a brief mention of people being fined over the possession of illegal weapons in Venice, although not really any notion of what those illegal weapons were. However, it, this at least implies that it wasn't a complete free-for-all. But I haven't really been able to come up with any sources that would corroborate this theory that you know prohibitive weapon laws were the thing that incentivized the creation of the Cinque Dea. And uh, nevertheless, it's you know it's worth considering it at least because there there does seem to be some precedent to it. You know another idea that I would like to address was that I've, I've seen floating around this idea that the Cinque Dea would have been traditionally worn on the back like this, and as Lindy Beige mentioned in his video on the subject, you know the, this this theory is based on just one picture, like one picture, and there, well also because. There doesn't really seem to be anything else that corroborates it. However, upon looking further into this, I actually came across the Holbein dagger. You know, it's a dagger described by Edward Oakeshott as the successor to the Cinque Dea as a high-class civilian weapon for self-defense. And while there is this stained glass picture that you can see here, it's, in, it's present in the Historisches Museum in Basel. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you know, deal with it. And it shows people in typical Renaissance fashion wearing Holbeins on their back, in the exact same way that the Cinque Dea was depicted. Now, coincidence? Maybe. You know, honestly, I, I, I don't really know. Now, truth is that the Cinque Dea likely just wasn't around long enough to be present in many contemporary depictions. You know, artists, they, they always tended to depict the weapons and armor of their day, even while making historical scenes. And that's how you get absurd paintings like these with these obvious Roman soldiers for the crucifixion of Christ. You know, in general, I don't think we should be as ready to proclaim that indeed the Cinque Deo was definitely worn on the back like this, you know, since evidence is so slim. And, you know, it's just a sad consequence of its very short 60-year popularity. But then again, history rarely really gives you the answers you want. But at the very least, it again, it's not something that was pulled out of thin air at all. 
Um, you're honestly really looking back on I, I somewhat expected to easily debunk both of these issues. Like, really, but, you know, history is kind of fascinating that way, and it turns out that they aren't really as baseless as I thought they would be at first. And this is not really the outcome that I thought I would get from it. But honestly, that's that's what makes history so great. At least it's it's what I love about it. Because you know, even events that that happened 800 years ago, like some crazy amount like this, you know, they they still get to surprise you in interesting ways sometimes. You know, even yeah, even it's almost a millennia ago. So yeah, and just yeah, sorry, that, that was my little nerd rant over. But let let's get on with it. So well, you know, with with these little things addressed, let's actually break this thing down and have a peek at how it was constructed. So when you look the weapon, when you take the weapon apart, you can actually see that it resembles the construction of a knife way more than it does that of a sword. You know, I'm of course referring to the holes in the tang of the sword. And these are really not that uncommon with knives, and they're also pretty common with certain eastern blades that are definitely not a red flag when picking a prom date. However, for European swords, having the handle riveted to the blade, it's pretty uncommon. An exception would be the Messer, but then again, characteristic of the Messer is of course its knife-like construction of the hilt. Not to mention that Mess literally means knife in German, so there is that. However, rather than having these metal rivets be seen, the Italians craftsmen, you know, they came up with these beautifully intricate little little designs to actually work them into the grip without just having these ugly iron dots in there. So that they just create these nice four little ornament in inlays. And these show up in pretty much all like 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 all the Cinque Deas in varying like shapes and sizes. But like I said, this is a high-end fashion statement and no expense will be spared at all. And so the, to that end, I created a bone grip with bronze inlaid and rivets. You know, I, I somewhat prefer an ivory grip, honestly, I prefer the look of it, but I, I didn't really want to kill any digital elephants either, so bone it is. Now, I've seen quite a range of different materials used for the grip, but the fundamental shape is always roughly the same. But the way I constructed the plates for the grip with the piece of bone was gluing it to a matching gold leaf plate, plate metal. You know, these plates have a 90 degree protrusion on the side, which you can see here. And this actually closes up the handle completely, so the tang is no longer visible, and you get this perfectly seamless look. Now, the sides often have this inscription on it, which is meant to aspire the realer to uphold the ideals of chivalry and manliness. And in my case, I just stuck to two simple phrases, be strong, be brave. Good life lessons in general, and a good inscription. Now, it would also be common for these phrases to take on a more religious aspect, but I only had so much space on my handle, so I just stuck with this. But as you can see, once you take the plates and rivet them to the tang from the other side, you get this perfectly enclosed tang, you don't really have any awkward looks, like a, you don't really see the tang like you would with the messer, and it just gives it like a really nice seamless look. And then with the grip riveted to the tang, it doesn't really seem like there is much of a use for a pommel at all. Like sure, it could be kind of handy to counterbalance the blade, I guess. But we already discussed that efficiency seems to have been, you know, an afterthought at best. But then again, you know, a nicely etched and gilded pommel, it just looks good, and the Italians seem to agree. Now to this end, I created a hollow pommel cap, where the tang passes through the whole thing, and is then simply pinned to the pommel. Uh, this would fully lock the grip in place and keep it secured even after heavy use. Now I haven't actually been able to confirm that this is definitely how it was always done. You know, when I go about creating my replicas, I, I derive most of my information from images I can find online or in books, or just from people generous enough to provide them to me if they have access to some that I don't. And this is what I came up with for the construction. Now, if you are somehow a collector, you, you own one of these blades, I'd be really happy to be proven wrong on this point, because I would really like to see how these things were attached. But, you know, looking at looking at what I could what I could find, you know, looking at the image I could get, this is the construction that I came up with. Now, I haven't really seen many historical designs that do this partial gilding, though, on the, on the pommel. And, but I just think it makes for a nice contrast, and I just rolled with it. However, it's more inspired by that Forged in Fire episode where they made a Cinque Dea, you know, this one. 
rather than actual history. So just something to keep in mind. It's a, it's a little bit of a, an aesthetic concession that I made for myself. Now there's not a whole lot to say about the guard, to be honest. It's a very typical shape for these weapons. And, you know, I couldn't find any that really deviate from this, from this crescent shape in any meaningful way. And, well, they're almost always heavily decorated as well, and you know, I just followed suit. But once again, I just partially gilded it, because I, I, f I just found out that a full gilding on these grips, they, it just, it looks a bit boring, is all. And then there's the real MVP, of course, you know, it's the plate. And I've seen very little undecorated Shinkudea plates at all. You know, I've looked at most of the ones that I could find in museums, and, you know, it's, it's again, like I've said this before, but the whole idea of these ultra-wide blades seems to have just been to be a canvas that I could paint upon with gold leaf. And, well, then so they did. And like we said at the beginning of the video, oftentimes, you know, they would depict scenes based in Greek and Roman mythology. You know, to symbolize this, I created the birth of Venus on one side, and on the other side I created Neptune and Amphitrite. And and fight it and fit it. Um, Neptune and some Greek chick on the other side, and in a style that's pretty similar to what what I could find in real life examples. Now we already know that the reason of the for the Renaissance's fascination with these ancient cultures, and so I just made sure to reflect their opinion of these ancient cultures in my choice of motif. And guys, I swear. I swear it's just for cultural reasons. You know, something interesting here though is the combination of gilding and bluing that would be used to create these paintings on the blade. Now, blued metal, in essence, is little more than a thin layer of oxidization, making it take on a range of color, like varying from reddish blue to black. And as an added benefit though, it, it does um, provide some corrosion resistance, though it still needs to be really well cared for. But there were a myriad of ways to actually blue metal that would not have been available in the 1400s. Though here is a glimpse at how it may have been done. The smoke there just starting to go to straw color. Check where it needs a bit more heat from the straw. If you let it for the blue first, you wreck it. There. It's going blue now. Stand by with your oil. Change for the heat, bit more on this side. Let it turn itself slowly. Now obviously there were no gas canisters back then, but now this could have easily been done with a forge, though I, I say easily, it would, it would have been extremely difficult and be very skilled for it, but it's possible. And also full link to the video in the description and also Greenleaf Workshop's channel. I find him, his video is extremely informative and you know highly recommend you go check it out. Now, of course when discussing the sword it's actually impossible not to make note of the insane amount of fullers that's present on the sword. And this was a really popular design with these earlier Cinquideas, which all used this 432 design. Now later versions actually got rid of this and they just had they just used one with like one little like a like kind of like what do you call it spine in the center. I'm 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 also not sure. Like, let's just call it a spine. Of course, the reasons for these was that to actually keep the weight down, as the blade is absurdly wide, so it would just weigh a ton without these. And in fact, like that's where the name of Cinquedea comes from. It's five finger blade, just because that's how wide it is at the base of the blade. So now let's actually have a look at some more Cinquedeas here. Now, what I like is to notice is how little variation there is in the overall shape. And the pommels are all very similar. They all have that little cross section in the hilt, the cards are all close to identical in shape, and the swords all have the same composition of grooves. And the question is then raised, well, were they all made by the same artisans? And it either does seem to be some overlap with the artisans who worked on individual Cinquedeas. You know, in this sense, Ercole de Fidel de Ferrara's group was responsible for a lot of etching on Cinquedeas, at least according to Edward Oakshot, and I'm pretty happy to take his word for it. 
And so other blacksmiths would probably be responsible for the blade or for the hilt, you know, tailors that would craft the scabbards, etc. And so there was likely just this whole small little ecosystem that came along in which the unique style of a Cinque Deo was created, or at least that's what I like to believe happened. Now, whatever the case may be, I uh, would really like to know what you think of the Cinque Deo. Now, do you think it holds up as a self-defense weapon? Or do you think it's just a rich man's novelty item that died out for good reason? Now, do, do please let me know in the comments below. I, I do read all of them. I, I try to respond to most of them. And, you know, as always, the 3D model and the renders, the textures, all of that good stuff that I use in the background, they're all available on my Gumroad page for just a single buck. So you can pick it up, you can use it in your game projects, in your mods, like whatever you do. And please let me know when you use it as well, because I, I love to see it pop up in like little projects that you guys do. But for now, I have been the blacksmith, and I will gladly see you next time. Bye bye Hello and welcome.